Welcome back to Wheeler Scientific. In today's video, we're diving into the fascinating world of sulfonylic acid synthesis. Previously, we produced aniline from nitrobenzene, which was derived from benzene, itself made from benzoic acid produced from tylene. Quite a journey, isn't it? Now let's transform that aniline into sulfonylic acid, a crucial compound in azo dyes, pharmaceuticals, and analytical chemistry. Here's what you'll need. 10 grams, about 10 milliliters, of freshly distilled aniline, 20 milliliters of concentrated sulfuric acid, a 250 milliliter round bottom flask, a reflux condenser, an oil bath, and a sodium hydroxide solution, about 10%. First, pour 10 grams of freshly distilled aniline into our 250 milliliter round bottom flask with a stir bar. Next, cautiously add 20 milliliters of concentrated sulfuric acid in small portions. This reaction is highly exothermic, so add the acid slowly to prevent overheating and ensure safety. Now attach the reflux condenser to our flask and place it into an oil bath. We then heat the mixture at 180 to 190 degrees Celsius for 4 to 5 hours with continuous stirring. During this time, aniline reacts with the sulfuric acid to form aniline hydrogen sulfate, which then loses a water group and rearranges to form our target compound, sulfonylic acid. In an aromatic compound with a single functional group, you have three positions the reaction can occur at. These are ortho, meta, and para. The functional group dictates which position the aromatic electrophilic substitution occurs. These are known as directant groups. If you have something like a nitro group, this would strongly deactivate the ring by inductively pulling electrons towards the group. This causes the density of the electrons to drop, leading to the substitution occurring on the meta position. In our case, we have an amine that is a strong activator, which increases electron density in the ring leading to either ortho or para position substitution. In the reaction, we get para bonding due to various reasons. One is the sulfonyl group is quite large and doesn't want to bond next to the mean. Meta and ortho can occur here, but they're in small enough quantities that it's negligible for a reaction. After heating, we need to check to see if the reaction is complete. We do this by taking a few drops of the reaction solution and adding them to a 10% solution of sodium hydroxide. If the solution is clear, then our aniline has successfully fully reacted and sulfonated. If you see oily drops of unreacted aniline, continue heating and retest in about an hour. Once the reaction is complete, let the mixture cool to room temperature. Once cool, pour into about 100 milliliters of cold water while stirring. This will precipitate the crude sulfonylic acid as a gray crystalline mass. The crude product is then collected using suction filtration and washed with ice cold water to remove any impurities. To further purify our product, we dissolve the crude sulfonylic acid crystals in just enough water to achieve a clear solution. Then add 2 to 3 grams of decolorizing carbon. After that, we allow the solution to cool to room temperature. I like to set it on a ring cork to allow it to cool slower than it would on the bench. This leads to larger crystal formation. 
We then collect the crystals once again with vacuum filtration. One thing to note is that the sulfonylic acid crystallizes from water with one molecule of water as a hydrate. To make anhydrous sulfonylic acid, we heat the hydrate at 110 to 100 degrees Celsius briefly. I threw the sulfonylic acid into the drying oven for about 10 minutes to produce anhydrous sulfonylic acid. After drying, we are left with around 8.6 grams of product. To confirm successful synthesis, I'm going to use two instrumental methods. The first one is FTIR. In FTIR, you measure the bonds, the stretching and bending of them. By passing light through them, IR light specifically, we can measure an energy out, and this energy can be adequated to different bonds and how they react. By this, we can tell the structure of a molecule and the functional groups that are present. To do this, we take the crystal of the sulfonylic acid and place it under the diamond detector. We then use the clamp to force it against the diamond detector so we get good data. We then run a scan. All the functional groups that we should see are present. To confirm our synthesis, we can also check it against a known library database. And after running that similarity search, we see that it matches the sulfonylic acid. Now these spectra are quite different, but they have all the necessary groups that are similar. Now they are different mainly because of a lot of different reasons, but the first one is our instruments were probably different. I have a cheaper lower end FTIR, this was probably taken on a high end one, so our scans are going to be quite different. While IR is a great instrument, it only shows functional groups, and there could be multiple functional groups in the same molecule, or you could have a mix of stuff. NMR is vastly superior. It'll show positions of unique protons and carbon and a various wide variety of molecules. Today we're just going to focus on proton NMR, which is the simplest method that we can do. Each proton NMR scan shows protons in unique positions, and based off of the peak output that we get, we can correlate that to a structure. Comparing what the data we got out to a known structure, we have successfully synthesized our compound. There's also a peak upfield, which is deuterated water, which we used as the carrier solvent. I would have preferred to use chloroform as that won't show up in our spectrum, but I had to use D2O because the chloroform would not dissolve our sulfonylic acid. And there you have it. Purified sulfonylic acid, ready for use in dye synthesis or pharmaceuticals. This synthesis not only gives us a valuable compound, but also demonstrates key techniques in organic chemistry. Thanks for joining us today, and stay tuned for more exciting chemistry adventures.